Okay. All right. And then here we go. Okay. Like, uh, as you know, we, I'm going to share just something really short. Hopefully it's really short. I try to make it really short, but you know how that goes sometimes. Yeah, maybe not so much. Um, so we'll see. I'm, I'm just going to try and go through the entire epistle of this Second Timothy. So, but we're not going to read the whole thing. We'll just read pieces and parts. And um, so we'll see if you have a Bible and you'd like to turn, you can turn to Second Timothy. If you don't, if you're eating, you know how we do it here. If you're eating, continue to eat, continue to enjoy. Uh, if you need to get up, get more food, get something to drink, feel free to do that. Um, if you would, though, uh, you know, just kind of keep the conversations down as we're going through this. So uh, right now, if you would, join me for just a quick prayer. Father, uh, we lift up this message to you. We thank you so much just for uh, bringing us into this and helping us, Lord, to be able to see these things and know these things. And, uh, Father, your word is, is truly a lamp to our feet and a light to our path and, and does show us where we need to be, where we need to go. And uh, we just lift it all up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So <clears throat> in the second epistle of Timothy, um, you know, it's kind of really looking at how many of us have had relationships with people, especially men of God or people of God. And sometimes when we separate from them or go away from them, it's like, you know, I, I don't know. It seems like so many times in the Christian world today, especially in the, in the West, we kind of just part company and say, you know, hey, okay, have a great time, do good things, you know, I'll send you an email, and we kind of shove people off and, you know, hey, you're on your own now kind of thing. Whereas Paul, um, even when Timothy becomes the pastor in Ephesus, which from what I understand in looking at the scriptures, um, had thousands of members. Um, you know, just kind of one of the things that we were looking at when we're going to be looking at Antioch uh, this Sunday in the book of Acts, um, by about the second century, it was estimated that there was as many as 100,000 Christians that belonged to the church in Antioch. Um, <clears throat> I think John Chrysostom uh, was the pastor of that particular church. And uh, the church itself was so huge that literally, you know, you couldn't throw a rock from one end of it to the other. It was that big. So, um, you know, and, and just packed with people, and they stood the entire time when they were going. There were no chairs. There was no carpeting, no air conditioning. You know, it was go in. You stand the whole time and do so. It, it's just so crazy when you and I, we think of this, and most of us, when we think of these churches here in the New Testament, we think they're all kind of like home fellowships, you know, kind of like our size churches, you know, like 10, 20, 30 people, right? So, but here... He stays very involved with Timothy, very connected to him. And we have this truly sold-out man of God. And when he's parting from Timothy, he's writing him this letter, and he's literally about to die. He knows he's going to die. You know, he knows it. As a Roman citizen, he knows he's not going to be crucified, but he knows, you know, at 4 a.m. on this day, they're going to take me out and they're going to cut my head off. I'm going to die. You know, so he knows this is going to happen, and he knows this is about to happen. And the things, we're going to kind of examine just what it looks like when somebody that's a godly person knows it's time. You know, knows that it, it's the end and what's going on. So looking at Paul saying goodbye to his beloved Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 1 and 2 says, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So he begins the letter by you know, making these very simple statements. You know, we know he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. You know, we've talked about that before and looked at that. Um, he is an apostle in his own right by what he has seen. He is not one of the twelve, but he's, he, he's chosen by God to lead and take the word, the gospel, to the Gentiles. And he says it's, he's not the apostle by the will of man or by the appointment of anybody, but by God. It's God's will that he is where he is. And for most of us, that can be tough sometimes 
with Paul in everything that he does. He says, it is God's will. This is why I am here. Okay? And he says, it's the will of God according to the promise of life, which is in Jesus Christ. The very reason that I have life in me is the fact that I know that I'm called by him. You know, and, and it can be kind of difficult sometimes because we want God to do this. We want God to do that. Hey, I'm serving you. Why isn't this easy? Why isn't that easy? Why is it so difficult? Here's Paul. He's writing Timothy's letter from prison. And he's scheduled to die. And he says, he doesn't say, you know, pray that God would show mercy on me. Or why is God doing this to me? He says, it is the will of God according to the promise of life, not death. You know, what's going on here is not death to him. And he says, Timothy, you're my beloved son. He's not actually Timothy's father. You know, he is in the faith. But, you know, he says, you are beloved to me. You're like one of my own kids if I had one. You know, it's I, I have this much, of, much affection for you. I love you dearly. Um, and then he says, grace, mercy, and peace. Without, you know, without... Without that, without understanding grace or experiencing grace, you can't really understand mercy. You can't understand peace. Now, I remember with my kids, one of the things when we taught them about mercy is when spanking times would come and how they would drop to their knees. You know, Casey may remember. I'm not sure. The boys surely did a lot. They got a lot more spankings. Um, but when the spanking time would come, they would drop to their knees and they would, they would cry, Mercy, Father, mercy. I mean, literally just like that. You know, but you know, shouting it, you know, mercy, Father, mercy, almost like somebody from a movie or something like that, you know, and, and but and but see, they understood what mercy was. Mercy was that holding of the hand. And you and I, when we experience the grace of Jesus Christ, we experience the utmost mercy that we ever could. OK, and how is that? Why is that? Because we in that experience of grace. In that experience of grace. We experience the greatest mercy because that punishment that should have been put on us is instead put upon Jesus Christ. So anyway, you know, he goes into this and he says these things. And then um, look at me with me, if you would, if you'd like, at verses 3 and 4. Um, and he says, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. And he's going to go on and he's going to talk about, you know, the reality of, of what's going on in Timothy's life, the reality of his faith, and that he saw it. But the thing that he talks about here, he says, I, I serve God, I, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. So that whole thing is, is do you have a good conscience in the way that you serve God, in the way that you're following God? I mean, do you really do it with a pure and good conscience? And the reality of who he is. Here, Paul says, you know what? I know that I absolutely followed God. He didn't say he followed him perfectly. He said, I followed him with a good conscience. I was really doing exactly what I knew he was calling me to do. Are you doing the same? And he tells Timothy, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. You know, just like in, um, when he was saying goodbye to the leaders in Ephesus in the book of Acts, they literally, it says, they wept on his neck. They grabbed a hold of him and they cried saying goodbye to Paul because he had ingratiated himself that much into the lives of those people and invested in them. And here with Timothy, he says, the last time I saw you, you cried for me. You know, Timothy literally wept when Paul was going away. You know, and it is that kind of affection that he had drummed up in him. Not because of, you know, manipulation or anything like that. We were just talking about that at the table a little earlier. How some people can say things to you and do things to you that, you know, kind of make you like them because of the way they, that, you, you know, they make you feel. But with this, he's saying, you're my son in the faith. We have such a faith and such a common faith with Jesus Christ together that it's so real that it affected you when I left. I saw you crying and it was real. You know, and he goes on to say, and your faith is authentic. I saw it in action. I saw it in action. 
And do you see it in action in yourself and in others? Verse 8, um, he says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. He relates here and he says the things that are going on here are because God is doing it. A lot of times we look at bad things that are happening to us in our lives and in the world, and we go, where is God? What is he doing? Why isn't he doing something here? And he says, listen, when these things come, you know, Paul is getting ready to be beheaded. He's going to die. And he says, just because I'm being killed, don't be ashamed of the gospel. You know, don't be ashamed of these things. And he says that, you know, he says, I, you know, of me, his prisoner. He doesn't say he's a prisoner of Rome. He doesn't say he's the prisoner, you know, uh, of the emperor. He doesn't say he's, prin- you know, prisoner because of he's a Christian. He says, of me, his prisoner. I'm Jesus Christ's prisoner. I'm his prisoner. You know, he gives that, uh, that the credit and he gives everything to him. If you want to take her to the back, you can. <laughs> okay. So, verse 13, he says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. You know, and that's the thing, the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. As we look through all the different scriptures of where Paul gives instruction to people and talks to people, he makes sense about the way he says you're supposed to be living your faith. He says, don't live like this. Do live like this. And he tells Timothy, he said, the same thing that I gave to you, that I told to you, he said, do it. You know, do it. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Not from an act of legalism or blind obedience, but in the act of if you love God, this is something you want to do, guys. Do you love him? He says. In faith and love, and the only place you can really find those are in Christ Jesus. Verse 15 says, oh, look at verse 14. He says, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. So he tells Timothy right there, I see a common thing between you and I in this, the Holy Spirit, which dwells in each of us. It was that community, that communion that is created by the act that they have together and he says this good thing was committed to you what is that good thing it is the sound teaching the words the things that have been given to him and it's crazy because here you have this man who has done so much for you know these people he has done so much in all these churches he's given so much and given everything and then in verses 15 through 18 you said you see where he says everybody began to turn away from me Everybody began to reject me. Why? Because he got, he was, you know, he was a prisoner. He was arrested for his faith. He was being taken away. You know, it was a shameful thing. And yet, these people began to turn away from him, and they knew why he was in there. These were fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who rejected him, turned away from him. And it's just one of those things as he does this, you know, and you look at the names that are mentioned here and think about this too. Not just many are called, few are chosen, but the fact is, is as he goes in here, these people are going to be remembered forever as those that abandon someone in the hour of their need. That's a crazy thing. These words are eternal that we read here. And so the way that you or I behave or treat someone can affect someone for an eternity. You know, we've got to be very careful and we've got to be real about our faith. And he's telling Timothy, he's like, you know, these people were loyal, not just to Paul, but to the faith of Jesus Christ. And real about it and true about it. The reality of their faith to be hold who Christ is and that he is in us. Do you recognize that in others that you say are his? And then he goes on in chapter two and he says, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's the same thing, the same pattern of sound words that he said earlier that I gave to you. Now I want you to give it to others. 
commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's that same thing we see. It's very common in the military to teach everybody your job. Everybody under you learns your job, and you learn the job of the person above you. That way when somebody drops out, you can step in. And so here he's saying, you know, you need to teach the people the word of God. They need to understand what it means because you're going to die just like me. I'm going to die. And when I go, are you going to be there ready with the word of God to endure and do these things? Look what he says in verse 3. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And then he goes on to talk about athletics and these things. And the whole idea is that you're running a race with Christ. You're running in these things and you're living for him. And you're going to look back at this and are you going to look at your life? And, and again, as we have seen over and over and over again, am I going to, when I look back at my life, is it going to be filled more with regret? Or is it going to be filled with the knowledge that once I hit that certain stride, once I came to that certain knowledge and point in my faith, I really did everything I could to live for him. Because he says, man, it's real. This is real. The faith that we live is real. The attacks from the enemy are real. The morality that is going to be placed upon you and the attacks on your own morality are going to be real. And he says it's just like going into war. It's life and death. It's a spiritual life and a spiritual death, but it is nonetheless a battle. It is a reality of a faith-filled life. He goes on to tell them in verse 22 of chapter 2, he says, Flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Verse 23, he says, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. A lot of times, that's one of the reasons when we have someone come into the fellowship who just wants to, you know, wants everybody to listen to them, wants everybody to listen to them, wants everybody, and begins to create arguments or to say things that are outside of the norm of faith. That's why he says, don't don't even listen to these guys. They're gone. You know, you put them outside. Because they're foolish, they're ignorant disputes. A lot of the things that go on with the law are in this, you know. And you guys, we are not to do this. It says in verse 24, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. Guys, he's, you know, the whole reason that we do these things, we're not doing it to win a fight or win an argument or to show that we're better than somebody where we want them to come to know and understand truth. Because this is real. This is not just us versus them or us versus the world. This is eternal death and eternal life. We have so much of a reality to experience in our faith, you know, that we want to understand these things. In verses 14 on, you know, he talks about this truth, these approved and disapproved workers, even names some names. And it's like, again, you know, these names that will go down in infamy, right? And this is eternal. These words will be here forever. You know? These names will be marked as someone who who shamed their walk with Jesus Christ. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, he goes on and he talks about, in the, you know, note this, in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves. And most of us, that's probably one of our biggest fights is the fact that we love ourselves way too much. What about me? What about me? When do I get to feel good? When do I get this? When do I get that? And it becomes one of those things that becomes a block and makes it to where we think that life isn't any good because some, it's not good for me. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. 
when you look around us in the world today, even in the Christian church, as many in the church begin to teach a, you know, an acceptance of immorality, of sin being accepted in the church, even as it is, and they are unloving, they are only caring about themselves, and does it make me feel good? And does it make others feel good? And it makes me feel good to make others feel good. And it becomes one of those things that tears the church down. And instead of listening to the sound words that Paul gave, they begin to listen and to hear things that encourage them to walk where they have a form of godliness but deny its power. In chapter 4, he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead as it appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And he says there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Guys, it's happening. These things are happening. There was a pastor of a church, and he had over 5,000 members. And he would actually set up booths and talk about the faith of other faiths. And he would say people like Gandhi and all that were in heaven. And he said, and he actually began to teach that there was no hell. When Jesus Christ himself said there was a hell. So apparently, you know, these two had a disagreement, and I'm going to side with Jesus every time. Which is why you and I have to understand. He says, you know, in that verse 1 of chapter 4, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead as appearing in his kingdom. Jesus Christ is real. He will return. He will return and he will judge everything. Everything that, the, that those that don't know him have done and everything that you and I have done will be laid before him. And what did we do with it? In verses 6 through 8 of chapter 4, now I'm going to end with this. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to those who loved his appearing. It's that whole idea here. You know, he's like, I'm getting ready to walk outside of the city, and they're going to cut my head off. But it's by my choice. I'm giving myself to God. This is my offering to Him. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 17, he says, Yes, I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. In Philippians 3.13, he said, I, I, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the race. And most of us, many of us here, you and I, man, we can look at our lives and go, oh, regret. Oh, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Start now. Do it now. Begin the race now. If you've struggled, if you fought, if you stepped out of the race for a while, if you stepped out of the fight for a while, step back in right now. Step back in right now and walk with him. Walk with Jesus Christ. Paul was abandoned alone. If you read chapter 4, verses 17 and on. He was abandoned and alone in verses 9 through 16. And here, even in, even in that, he says, the Lord is faithful. Verse 17, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Guys, he loves you. And he will never forsake you. Don't look at our circumstances or the things that are going on around us as an example of whether God's blessing me or not. The fact that he is giving us strength to get on and to move on is the fact that God is blessing us. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now, Lord, and we thank you for this time together and pray that you would encourage each and every one of us, Lord, that we would walk with you, that we would see your word and what it is that you have for us. And Father, I just pray that as we go through these things in life, as we experience these things, Lord, that you would move in us and, and, Lord, keep us focused on you. 
Uh, Father, let us hear the words of Paul as he is ministering to his, his son in the faith, Timothy. Which